Okay. So now we've taken on the ionic compounds. We looked at metals and the behavior of them. Finally, now we get to covalent bonding, where we're going to park on this type of bonding for the next couple of weeks. We have two and a half weeks, and then we'll have, well, two weeks from tomorrow will be our quiz over the bonding. Um, and you know, thrown in there is gonna be our testing week. So that's going, next week is going to be a choppy week. This week we only have four days. Next week we have three school days. Uh, we'll get it all in though. So anyway, uh, covalent bonding is going to contrast with ionic bonding. There's a couple things going on. First, we talked when we looked at a model of an ionic compound, how there's not any distinct molecules when you have ionic compounds. Uh, they just make this network. The ions arrange themselves very specifically to prevent similar charges from being too close to each other. In contrast, when you have a molecular compound with covalent bonding, every particle is a, a standalone unit. Uh, it's, we have molecules. So there are definite molecules in, with covalent bonding. These are water molecules. Every one of these is the same as every other one. This oxygen is definitely chemically bonded to both of those hydrogens, so that makes up one unit. And then this is a separate unit. There's no interchanging parts of that for parts of that, like there were here, like there were here. <laughs> uh, like that green, who is it attached to? Is it attached to that? Well, yeah. Is it attached to that? Yeah. Is it attached to that? Yeah. Is it I mean, there's, they uh, just uh, depend on uh, how the overall um, uh, arrangement is. I also mentioned um, this is oxygen, and remember that oxygen is diatomic. So each oxygen is attached to another oxygen atom with a covalent bond. This is just a computer model. This is not really the way that oxygen atoms, like, this is not a picture of oxygen atoms, it's a model of them. Oxygen molecules are not very attracted to each other. They have a very slight attraction, but, but really you can't even call it an attraction. When this molecule is around that molecule, there really is very little that draws them close to each other. However, in contrast with the water molecule, water is a polar molecule. It's got a positive side down here and a negative side up here. Well, when the negative side here is around the positive here, they will pull together, like two oppositely end, uh, opposite ends of a magnet pull together. So these water molecules do yank themselves together. They're attracted to each other. Water, therefore, is a liquid. With no attraction or very little attraction, oxygen would be a gas. So you can have the different physical states for covalent compounds, molecular compounds. It just depends on how attracted the particles are to each other. We call those intermolecular attractions. We'll spend time on that later next week. Uh, intermolecular attractions are important. They describe a lot about uh, the way the world behaves. Like, for example, why does DNA have the arrangement? It's got that, well, we all know is the double helix, that ladder that's twisted up. Uh, that's because of intermolecular attractions and hydrogen bonding. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of implications uh, that, uh, that intermolecular attractions give us. Okay. Now, th the traditional path uh, talking about covalent bonding would be, here's how we write Lewis structures, here's how we figure out the shapes of molecules, and then we'll talk about orbitals and how the orbitals are being used, uh, and then we get to intermolecular. We do, though, have one topic that, this is an exceptional thing that I would like to just mention now, and I'll remind you of later, but uh, this, at the beginning here of covalent bond. Again, this is an exception. There's actually very few of these types of compounds, but I want to uh, mention them now. So we looked at ionic compounds and how they always make a solid because of the attraction of charges. You can also have very hard solids in covalent bonding uh, if you have a network solid, a covalent network solid. The best example of a covalent network solid is diamond. Now, diamond is pure carbon. It's pretty amazing that that, that 
we think, if I say the word carbon, and I ask you to have a picture of carbon in your head, I think of, and maybe you do too, uh, black and dirty. I, I think of coal and burning coal and incomplete combustion where you have black soot coming up. That's carbon, yes. Diamond is also pure carbon. If you take coal and it's in the right place uh, under the ground, if it's up at the convergence of a like two tectonic plates and you have the plates moving toward one another, generating a huge amount of pressure, and the temperature gets real high too, then that coal can change into diamond. And what happens here is in a diamond, remember that carbon from our organic chemistry, carbon has four bonding sites that can make four bonds. If a carbon makes four bonds to four other carbons and each of those are bonding to four other carbons, and each of those are bonding to four other carbons, you're going to get a structure that looks like this. And this is an amazing structure because this is not just a whole bunch of carbons that have kind of pulled together. These are carbons that are chemically bonded to each other. So a diamond is one big molecule. It's one big continuous molecule. Uh, it's amazing. It's, it, the structure of it is fabulous. Um, and you know, it's so far and so different from that black soot that we think of when I say carbon, <laughs> um, it, it really is pretty fascinating. There is a scale. Material scientists uh, have come up with something called the Mohs hardness scale. Mo M O H is named after somebody. Mohs hardness scale ranks the hardness of substances, solids, from one up to ten. Diamond is a ten. It is the hardest material. I think talc. Like you can push your finger into a solid piece of talc. Um, that's a soft solid. Uh, diamond is the hardest. I think it's the hardest, both natural and synthetic substance that we know of. Diamond is, because if you want to break a diamond, you don't just uh, break the attracted particles away from each other. You literally have to break through zillions of covalent bonds. That does not happen easily. Um, so yeah, diamond is, uh, is really valuable, not only for its beauty, you know, the, the internal reflection that you get in a diamond, how, you, the light waves can go into a diamond and then bounce around inside of the diamond uh, with the effect of a prism a lot of times and then you know kind of uh, uh, get kicked back out. The internal reflection in diamond is amazing, but also it's super nice for industrial applications. Like people who cut really hard things uh, will buy diamonds to put into their saw blades. Diamonds are really important for, uh, for cutting things. So yeah, I mean, there's there's a many different markets, not just the jewelry world that uh, that makes use of diamonds. Anyway, uh, so the properties of diamond, because you got this huge molecule, um, that makes it unique among covalently bonded things. Graphite is another form of carbon. Now graphite is also black and dirty. Graphite is in our pencil lead. Um, graphite involves carbons making a hexagon shape like cyclohexanes, and several of them link together. And when I say several, I see several here in the drawing, but in actual graphite, there's billions and billions of these cyclohexanes that have bonded together, and they make layers. If you'll notice, when you got all these hexagon layers, um, every carbon is bonded to three other carbons. It's bonded within its own cyclohexane, but then it's also bonded to the next cyclohexane, so every carbon has three on it. Uh, and so you're still left with one more bond they can form. What they wind up doing is they make pi bonds to one another. One layer makes pi bonds to the next layer. That's not as strong of a bond. In fact, you take your pencil and you just run it on paper and it's attracted enough to paper that you, you break those pi bonds and leave some of the graphite behind. And that's how we write. So this is also considered a network solid, but it really is more of a two-dimensional network because the layers are flat in graphite. This is a three-dimensional network. This is strong stuff. Another example of a network solid is silicon dioxide. The Earth's crust has a whole lot of silicon in it, uh, and silicon dioxide is what makes almost all of our sand on the Earth. Um, silicates are, uh, are, are what our sand is made of. Now, we have a whole, I looked, I've looked every couple of years, and in fact, yesterday was was another try to uh, a fresh look. 
I go on to like Google Images, and I look for better, more complete models of silicon dioxide, and I never come up with anything better than this, and I don't like this one very much. Um, but yeah, if you imagine, this is one silicon dioxide unit, and then each oxygen, remember, makes two bonds, so the oxygen that's attached to this silicon dioxide can also connect to another silicon dioxide, maybe it's that one, which is connecting to, well, that one, we don't see the other oxygen on that, but yeah, this makes a big network. And so a sand grain often is one big molecule as well. Now I will admit that because we have different elements in silicon dioxide, there's silicon and oxygen in it, this is not as strong. So you can heat up sand and, and that's how we get glass. Um, but it, you do have to heat it up pretty hot to get sand to melt. So covalent network solids are one big molecule. They're very hard and they have high melting points because in order to melt these things down, literally you have to break covalent bonds to do that. And not just a few bonds, you gotta break a whole bunch of covalent bonds, um, making them super hard. So when we get into covalent bonding, this is a subset a small subset, but we should know about it. And I didn't mention just over here, there are three types, or not three, three different network solids that you should be aware of. Diamond is the most common and most well-known network solid. Silicon dioxide like I have up here. And then also silicon carbide. Silicon and carbon both make four bonds. And so you can get this network of silicon and carbide, uh, or carbon atoms uh, that, that will make a network solid as well. Watch out for those because they are known for having such high melting points. Sometimes a question will be uh, brought up to trick you. They'll, they'll give you a, like a multiple choice question. They'll say, which of these four things has the highest melting point? And they'll have like oxygen. You know it's not gonna be oxygen. And they'll have sodium chloride. And then one of the choices will be silicon dioxide. And so when you look at it, you think, well, all these are molecular compounds, but then the sodium chloride is ionic. So you want to choose the sodium chloride? That's wrong. If one of your choices is silicon dioxide, they're trying to trip you up. That is the correct answer because covalent network solids have a very high melting point. Sand, not sand, that's what that is. Salt, sodium chloride, is high as well. You have to heat up sodium chloride, I think it's 600 degrees, to get it to melt. That's hot, but that's going to be even higher because it's a network solid. So anyway, just watch. I think the book has a question like that. When you start doing your homework uh, in this chapter, like there is some place that you're gonna run into that question. And I'll remind you, hey, remember, you've got a network solid. Um, and that'll be the, the key to that. Okay, so I did at least want to introduce you to that small group of uh, covalent, covalently bonded compounds. We're going to move on now. We're gonna spend the rest of our time with Lewis dot structures. Uh, dot structures are something we have to be able to do. If, if you're asked anything about the nature of a compound, the first thing you're probably going to do is write out its Lewis dot structure. If you need the shape of it, you write its Lewis structure. If you need to know whether it's polar, you gotta have the Lewis structure. So that is always the first thing that we do. I need to warn you that um, I think there are seven of us here at the school that teach Chem 1. So we probably have at least somebody from every Chem 1 teacher even in this room. What you're going to see, the way we do dot structures, may be different than what you learned in Chem 1. Uh, and that's going to present uh, a, an issue for you. I remember myself learning how to do dot structures when I was in high school and I had chemistry. And then when I went to college, my first year, my freshman chemistry course in college, the professor taught us to do it different. The professor did something like this. And this is not the way that I learned how to do them. And I, you know, I thought I was big stuff. I was pretty arrogant when I was in uh, high school and college. I got very good grades. I just thought I was like a DT or something. I mean, I, I thought I was all of that. But I wasn't. I didn't know it at the time though. I just thought I was big stuff. And so this professor was trying to teach me something different and I was comfortable with it, I, the way I had learned how to do uh, dot structures. So I just stuck with the way that I had learned it. Well, I didn't realize at the time, but they were teaching us this because they had more complex dot structures than I had to do in high school. So on the test, I got beat up pretty bad because I was still trying to do these more difficult 
uh, dot structures with a too simple procedure or process. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of got it handed to me on that one. And I thought, uh, you know, maybe I should have paid better attention. And so, you know, you go through these things and you realize, oh, maybe I wasn't as good as I thought I was. Uh, and it's been a lifelong process for me. I, I don't think of myself as arrogant anymore. You might, but not so much for me. I tell you all that in my own personal experience to tell you I know how tempting it is to just stick with what you already know. But I really want to encourage you, uh, take this procedure on and try to learn how to do dot structures this way. Yes, you may have learned a simpler way to do it. And I know you'll be more comfortable with that old way to do it. And you got away with doing it the simpler way, possibly, uh, in Chem 1. But we're going to be doing more complex things in here than you had to do in Chem 1. So yeah, try this. <laughs> and having to unlearn something is never fun. But um, we're going to do a lot of examples. And so please just give it an effort to, uh, to hang on to what, what I'm trying to show you here. I'm not doing this again because I think that my way is the best way and you shouldn't do it the way other teachers do. No, I envy a lot of the way that teachers, uh, they teach their students to do things. Uh, but this is going to keep you out of trouble. Trust me on Okay, so when you are given a chemical formula and you need to write the dot structure for it, we have a five-step process for doing the dot structure. One, all you have to do is grab the periodic table, and I, we will be referring to the periodic table. So if you can't see where things are on this periodic table, make sure you have one that you can read. Count how many electrons, how many, not electrons, valence electrons the atoms in the formula have. Just count up the number of valence electrons, add them all together. Sorry. I remind you, I don't think you need to be reminded, but I'm going to remind you anyway. The valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost S and P orbitals. You have the inner noble gas core, and then after that is the valence electrons. Um, if I were to give you something like tin, number 50, tin, how many valence electrons are in tin? Remember, the definition, the outermost S and P. Yes, there are some D electrons present in tin. You don't count those. I'm not saying they're not there. Yeah, they're there, but they're not considered valence electrons. It's the two in the S, and then tin has two electrons in the five. Yeah, five P. Um, so that would have four valence electrons. Tin has four valence electrons. The valence electrons are really the only ones that we care about with bonding. Because the inner electrons, like the noble gas core, they don't do anything. They're there, but they do nothing in terms of bonding. Sometimes they dictate what happens with periodic properties, as we learned. They very much dictate what happens with periodic properties. But with bonding itself, with the way one atom behaves with another, it, it's only the valence electrons that are affecting it. So we're going to count up the number of valence electrons, add those together, and have a number. And then uh, we're going to start doing our, our structure where we'll put the least electronegative element in the middle. We have a trend for electronegativity. It is uh, always, as we go to the right and up, the electronegativity goes up. So for our central atom, we're using the least electronegative. We're going to use the one that's farthest down and left. In general, the first element in the formula will be the central atom. Almost always. All you have to do is take that first element and put it in the middle. Yes, there are exceptions, there's always exceptions, like water, H2O, the O is in the middle, but almost always, it's the first element given that you put in the middle. So the other elements I call peripheral atoms. Um, the peripheral atoms are those on the outside. I like to use that word, um, not outside atoms, because I mean, there's not really an inside. Um, so yeah, the peripheral atoms are going to go get attached to the central atom, first using single bonds. That may change, but at first just attach the, the uh, outside atoms, the peripheral ones with a single bond. And then we have to keep in mind the octet rule. We're going to start adding lone pairs around all that. Once the atoms are all present, then we need to make sure that everybody has eight electrons. 
Start putting dots around, pairs of dots around every atom so that all atoms are following the octet rule. They have eight electrons. After you're done with that, you pretty much have the hard work done. Then we have to evaluate, okay, now look at your structure. Does it have the number of electrons as what we counted in number one? If it does, then we're done. You have made the dot structure, all you needed was single bonds and it's done. If it doesn't have the same number of electrons, then we have to pay attention to number five. We have to get rid of some electrons. Well, that's where we start making double bonds and triple bonds. I'm going to have two slides of examples for you. The first slide, I actually am giving you a boost here. I'm saying, okay, don't forget, figure out how many electrons you need. Uh, on the second slide, I didn't do that, and I won't ever after this. Uh, just to get us going, though, I had those. So we're going to call this first slide the Chem 1 slide. This, these are the examples that I expect Chem 1 students to be able to do. The next slide, this, we have graduated from Chem 1 now, and we'll go on to advanced chemistry. Uh, but let's do the Chem 1 slide first. Okay, so for SEF2, we're going to try to make the dot structure for it. Um, if you remember how to do dot structures, this is going to be kind of tedious because you'll be like, okay, why are you going so slow? But I'm just trying to be methodical about this, and make sure that we get the process correct. So we count the number of electrons. SE is in the oxygen family. Oxygen family has six valence electrons. All the elements in that family have six. So we have six valence, sorry, I was on the wrong setting. Six valence electrons in selenium. And then there's two fluorines. Fluorine is next to oxygen over there, so it has seven, two times seven. The most valence electrons any atom's gonna have is eight. Because once you get to eight, you get to a noble gas, then the next element, you start a new energy level, starting back at one. Six plus 14 is 20 electrons. So we're going to need 20 electrons to be shown in the dot structure. We always start with simple examples. This is gonna be a very simple example. So the least electronegative element is going to go in the middle. Fluorine is the highest electronegativity of the whole periodic table. That will never go in the middle. So we'll put the SE in the middle. And then uh, that was step number two. Step three is attach the peripheral atoms, the fluorines, with single bonds. And we remember, because we did all those structures in organic chemistry, we remember that a dash or a line represents a pair of electrons, it's two electrons. The selenium and the fluorine are each sharing a pair of electrons. So we just like that, we've zipped through steps one, two, and three. We have counted the number of electrons, we put the SE in the middle, we've attached the fluorines. Next thing, add electrons around all atoms. Right now the fluorine only has two electrons attached to it. That's not gonna get us very far. Everybody's gotta follow the octet rule. The octet rule is the whole reason that bonds are made and molecules are made. So three pairs of electrons around the fluorine. The SE is gonna need a, two pairs of electrons to get eight around it. And then the F needs three pairs of electrons to get eight around it. So now everybody has eight electrons. And we stop, we, we may be done now, but we're going to count two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. Count the number of electrons and check the number of electrons we have shown in our structure versus how many we counted that the SE and the two F brought in. The SE and two F have 20 valence electrons we have shown 20 electrons here with everybody following the octet rule. This is the correct dot structure. Now remember, dot structure does not have to give us what the shape is. This is not a linear molecule, but the dot structure is not intended to show us shape. We'll figure out the shape later. We're just done with the dot structure right now. Okay, that's an easy example. Let's go on to the CO2, unless anybody has any questions about anything about the process. CO2. Carbon has four valence electrons, and then there are two oxygens, each having six. 12 plus four is 16 electrons. So we'll decide which element goes in the middle. It's gonna be carbon. Carbon's farther left. First one in the formula anyway. Put that in the middle. And then two O's. One, two. It doesn't matter how they're arranged. You can put the O on the right and then one of them on the bottom or whatever. It does. Just attach them, I don't care where. Then um, we're gonna have to add our electrons. This process is pretty simple, it's not, not bad. It's different maybe from what you learned, but it's not bad. 
So now we have everybody with an octet. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. It's very similar to that one. 20 electrons. But when we look back over here, a carbon and two oxygens should only have 16 electrons. So my structure that I've drawn has too many electrons in it. Well, that's where we have to use step number five up here. It says if you have too many electrons, you're going to have to make double and triple bonds. Double or triple bonds. Um, make them on atoms that are already attached to each other. That's what I mean by the word adjacent. Two atoms that are already attached, that they still have a lone pair each. What you want to do is erase lone pairs from each and then make a double or triple bond. So what I'm saying is this. I have four too many electrons. Four too many. This has 20 electrons, I should only have 16 at the end. So what I do is I turn on my eraser mode and I'm going to erase a pair of electrons off of that oxygen and a pair off of the carbon. They're already bonded to each other. Now I'm going to erase a lone pair from each and make a second bond between. Now what have I just done? I have erased four electrons but added in two. So the net change is I have gone down by two electrons. This should now have 18. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Everybody still has eight electrons. Well, we're still okay with the octet rule. I put a second bond in between the C and the O. So the oxygen still has eight electrons around it. The carbon still has eight electrons around it. I've just, I've gotten closer to my uh, required number of electrons. But I still need to get rid of two more electrons. So I can choose either to put a third bond between the carbon and the oxygen on the left or make a double bond over here. It doesn't matter which you do, they're both correct. I'm going to choose to just make it balanced and put the double bond over on here, but if you want to make a third bond, you can. So erasing, whoops. Erasing a lone pair off of both of those, that's the way we're always going to make double and triple bonds. You can't add another bond in, uh, in unless you've erased uh, a lone pair from each. Now what we have is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 electrons. We have the number that the carbon and the two oxygen brought in. So that would be CO2. ClO4 with a negative. All polyatomic ions are held together with covalent bonds, so we should be able to write the dot structures of covalent, of um, polyatomic ions. The negative one ion charge, the ClO4 is perchlorate, it's got a negative one. It had to gain an extra electron from somewhere else, like a sodium atom that had to give off an electron, it's got it from somewhere. Uh, so when you count up the number of electrons, you're gonna count how many the Cl had, that was seven, four times six for the oxygen, plus one more, because it has a negative one. Would you take a moment and do the dot structure for perchlorate? It is different because it's got that charge on it, but the dot structure is pretty simple for it. We have seven electrons from the chlorine, four times six from the oxygen, plus one more from that negative one charge. Uh, so 24 plus eight is 32 electrons 
should be in for chlorine. We put the Cl in the middle. Um, now, oxygen and Cl are both directly attached there on the periodic table to the fluorine. Can we tell which one is more electronegative or less electronegative in terms of our trend? The trend is, as we go left and down, um, the electronegativity goes down. So oxygen's to the left and chlorine is straight down. So which one is it? Well, we see that chlorine is written first in the formula. We'll go with that. Chlorine's in the middle. And besides that, there's four oxygens. You're not gonna put four oxygens in the middle. Uh, so chlorine is uh, in the middle, attached to four oxygens with single. There is one extra electron that the chlorine didn't have originally, and the oxygen didn't have originally. We don't need to show like where that is. It's just one of the 32 electrons. There's nothing that's unique or special about that added electron. It's just gotta be one of them. But, uh, let me get to my butt here in a second. Um, so when we add our lone pairs around, so we've got made the single bonds, we've attached all the oxygens, get the lone pairs around, that makes 32 electrons. So we're done. That's all that it took uh, to get this dot structure. I will say though, when you give the dot structure of a polyatomic ion, you don't need to say, hey, here is the here is the extra electron. No, it's just one of them. But since this is a charged thing now, it's got a negative one charge. That is different than a neutral thing. So we normally, it's proper to indicate the fact that we have an ion by putting brackets around the ion dot structure and indicate what its charge is on the outside. Just to say, hey, this thing is not neutral. This is not a standalone molecule. It's an ion. And so we indicate ions like that. It's proper. If I were to ask you to do the perchlorate dot structure on a test, if you forgot to do the brackets, I wouldn't mark you wrong. But it's, it, it, if you're doing the AP exam and you're supposed to write a dot structure, uh, if it's a polyatomic ion, it just shows the reader, hey, I know what I'm doing here. I'm not a rookie. Okay, so we have three Chem 1 dot structures. You would have done dot structures like this last year. Now we've graduated from Chem 1. Let's go to the next slide. So we're going to take on this one, first one is SF6, sulfur hexafluoride. Okay, let's get at it. We have six electrons in sulfur and six times seven electrons from the fluorines. So six times seven is 42 plus another six is 48. Okay, 48 electrons. <laughs> Well, that's a lot of electrons. Decide which one goes in the middle. What's going to be our central atom? Either sulfur or fluorine is not going to be the fluorine because fluorine is never the lowest electronegativity. It's going to be the sulfur. So we put sulfur in the middle, and now what do we do? We have six fluorines to put on. And they don't really have any other place to go except to attach to the sulfur. And that is going to look weird and doesn't seem right. Put six fluorines on the sulfur, and we just have to deal with it. <laughs> What's weird about this? I thought we had this thing called the octet rule, which says that atoms are most stable when they have eight electrons around them. How can we have this compound where the sulfur doesn't have eight? It's got 12 electrons. It's not even close. It's got 150% of the required number of electrons. Is this right? Well, I'll tell you, SF6, sulfur hexafluoride, is a real compound. It's a gas. Um, I don't even know what they use it for, but I know that sulfur hexafluoride exists. So this is correct. Fluorines never make more than one bond. Anyway, fluorine's almost like hydrogen. It makes one bond and then it's done. Because its electronegativity is so high, it does not like to share much. Um, so anyway, how can this be? Well, I have a, a note for you. Let's just uh, take a, a little side note here. And this is why this can be. If this is right. It's right to have six fluorines on the sulfur. Here we go. Elements. 
in the third row or bigger can hold more than eight electrons. Elements in the third row or bigger elements than that, they are big enough <coughs> that they can handle more than eight electrons. Around. Now, this is exceptional. Um, it, the octet rule, I'm not throwing out the octet rule and saying, no, well, you know, we've been lying to you this whole time, the octet rule isn't a thing. It, the octet rule is a thing. <coughs> Generally, atoms are more stable when they can have eight electrons around them. I'm not changing anything that I said. I'm just showing you, yes, there are some exceptions. Now, what's going on? Why third row or bigger? Well, first of all, atoms in the second row of the periodic table, they're really tiny. A tiny little atom, you just can't crowd that much around. So you can get, get four things around the central atom from the second row, and that's all you're gonna get. But in the third row, remember, we go down a row in the periodic table, we've added another layer of electrons, so that it's naturally bigger, and it can have more stuff around it. But also, even more importantly, in the third row, we start the third energy level of electrons. We have 3s and 3p, those are the valence electrons, but then there's also the 3d. Now, sulfur is what we're talking about up here. Sulfur is before 3D. So sulfur doesn't have any 3D electrons. However, sulfur is using the third energy level, and it can use some of its 3D orbitals for bonding. And that's what it does. And that can only happen if it's in the third row or bigger. Second row does not have the luxury of those D orbitals that it can use. It just doesn't have Second energy level only has 2S and 2P, and that's it. So, yeah, this can happen. Now, I will tell you one other thing to qualify this. Uh, I'll just make parentheses. This is only for the central atom. The peripheral atom is always going to follow the octet rule. All the outside atom, always. Everybody's going to get eight electrons around the outside. Except for hydrogen, it gets two. But that central atom, we can do odd things with. So this is correct for sulfur and sulfur hexafluoride. It's correct. The sulfur winds up with 12 electrons around it. It's crazy. Uh, now we're not even done yet because um, we were asked to do the dot structure for it. Um, the correct dot structure should have all the lone pairs in it. Don't leave the lone pairs out on the quiz and test if I ask you to have dot structure. I will mark it down. Include them all. Looks like ink splatter, I guess, but. Uh, they're all there. And if you count them, there are, when we, once you just get eight around each fluorine, there's six of them, that makes 48 electrons. So that's correct. That's SF6. Yes? Um, yeah, you definitely could. Yep, just do line, line, line like that. That's totally fine. Yep. Okay. Um, was I going to say something else about that? I guess not. Let's go on to this next one. <laughs> Next one is wacky too. Xe, xenon difluoride, xenon. Where is xenon again? The noble gas is, haven't we been indoctrinated our whole life? Noble gases, they can't make any bonds. They already have a full valence shell. They don't make bonds. Well, that's true. For a long time, chemists in the chemistry world thought noble gases don't slash can't make bonds. However, um, they, they messed with xenon enough to find out, yeah, xenon, if they, if they beat it up enough, it will make some compounds. So xenon difluoride is a thing. This is a, a real, I don't know anything about it. I've never used any xenon compound before, but I know that there are several xenon compounds that exist. Um, I would guess that the delta G for producing this is positive. I don't think xenon difluoride would be made spontaneously. I think you have to, you have to heat it up or do something to it. Uh, to get it to form, but it'll it'll exist. Okay, so let's do the dot structure for xenon difluoride. It would have uh, how many electrons? Xenon itself has eight, and then there's two fluorines each having seven. So 14 plus eight is 22 electrons. 
So we need a structure with 22 electrons. Put the xenon in the middle and then attach the fluorines to it. All right, easy enough. And then uh, we're gonna add our lone pairs of electrons. There they are. Now count, this may be it. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. Hmm. 20 electrons, but we should have 22. A xenon and two fluorines to add up to 22 electrons. Hmm. So we need two more electrons in this. Now, on the previous page, we had too many electrons. We had to get rid of some. That's where we use double and triple bonds. What if we have to add more electrons? Hmm. I remind you of this comment over here. Xenon is, in the fifth row of the periodic table, big. It can handle more than eight electrons. And so if you need to put more than eight electrons around somebody, as long as that central atom is big enough. I, as many times as I've taught this specific example and this idea, I still feel dirty. I feel like I need to go clean myself off after I do this. We need two more electrons, here they come. Doesn't that look stupid? This is terrible, but it's right. That's what we have to do. The xenon has 10 electrons around it now. It's got bond, bond, lone pair, lone pair, and then that thing. Well, that's another lone pair of electrons, and that should be there. That is the electron arrangement for xenon difluoride. When you did this in Chem 1, you learned some shapes of molecules. You learn tetrahedral and trigonal planar and bent, and, and you remember all that, or you remember some of that, I'm sure. It comes back to you. I will say, when we get to these exceptional ones, we are going to be seeing new shapes. All the old shapes are a thing. There's Most of our shapes are going to be the tetrahedral, the trigonal planar, and the pyramid and all that. But then we are going to have some of these new shapes as well. We get in these exceptional electron configurations. So that's coming tomorrow. I'll show you all the shapes. Rather than, I think in Chem 1, if I remember right, there are six shapes we have to know, and two of them are bent, so you get two different bents. I count them as two of the six shapes. After this, uh, you're gonna have, we're not going to quite double that, but we'll have more like 10 or 11 shapes that we're gonna have to know, because we have these exceptional things. Okay, how are we doing for time? Just a few minutes left. This is one other topic I wanted to show you today. Uh, rather than having us kind of walk through the nitrate, I just want to show you what nitrate looks like. Nitrate is not an exceptional one. It really doesn't belong here in the advanced chemistry um, uh, group. It, it could be back on the previous slide. Nitrate would have its dot structure look like this. If we did all the counting of electrons, we would come up with a nitrogen in the middle, double bond to one of the oxygens to get the right number of electrons, uh, and then we have two oxygens that were single bonded to each other. Because it's an ion, I put the brackets around with the charge. What we see here is a double bond on one of the oxygens and single bonds on the other oxygens. We would expect, if we could analyze the bonds in nitrate, we would expect one of the bonds to be stronger than the other two, right? Because a double bond should be stronger than single bonds. So what do we find about nitrate? Is one of the bonds stronger than the other two? It turns out all three of the bonds have the same strength. They're all equal. How can that be if one of them is a double bond and the other two are a single bond? Well, that brings up a different concept. It's called resonance. We actually did talk about resonance briefly in the organic chapter. And we talked about benzene. Um, and I'll bring that back in a moment, but uh, I want you to notice something. So I just went to, a, uh, I went to Google and I typed in resonance in nitrate and I would search for images and I got this and this is exactly what I was looking for. Take a look at the three different ways that we could draw the nitrate dot structure. We have the double bond between the N and the O on the right. The double bond could just as likely though be between the N and the O on the top. And just as likely also, it could be between the N and the O on the left. Three different oxygens could each, the same likelihood, have that double bond on them. So 
So like I say, when this is analyzed, we don't find one having a stronger bond energy than the other two. They all wind up having the same bond energy. And the reason is because nitrate does not exist at any moment like this or this or this. I'll say that again. Nitrate does not exist at any one moment like this or like this or like this, even though that's the way that we draw it. And so what does it do then? It winds up taking an average of all three of these. And rather than having one double and two singles, it winds up with one and a third, one and a third, and one and a third bonds. That still adds up to four bonds. But it makes them all equal because they're all just as likely as one another. So here's the bottom line. Here's the summary of what I'm trying to get to. When you have a structure that has a double bond, and the double bond could just as likely be in more than one place, then the structure is going to average out all the places that that thing could be. And this is the way that we write it. We would write it with the different uh, structures and the different places for the double bond and then just put the two-sided arrows in there. There is something that we call bond order. The bond order in this case is 1.33, one and a third, because this bond is not just a single bond, it's one and a third bonds. This bond is not a double bond, it's one and a third bonds. And then this bond is not a single bond, it's one and a third bond. So we still have four bonds. And this is not like a human design. We didn't say, okay, this is how nitrate should work. So nitrate, we're gonna program you to, no. Nitrate does this and we were supposed to figure out what it's doing. <laughs> and this is what we've come up with. So bond order has a calculation. What you do is you take how many total bonds you have divided by the number of peripheral atoms. So we had four total bonds divided by three atoms they were shared among, so they each get one and a third bonds. That's resonance. Um, we saw resonance. I mentioned the benzene ring. Check this out. Oh my goodness. This just makes me smile. This was like the beginning of our journey. Way back in September. We had benzene. Remember, there's alternating double and single bonds. I told you back then, when we analyzed the bonds in benzene for the strength, there's not one, there's not three that are stronger than the other three. They're all the same. Why? Because benzene really is doing this. It's sharing all the, the, the bond order is 1.5. Um, yeah, so rather than double, single, double, single, double, single, it's one and a half, one and a half, one and a half, one and a half, one and a half. So we have the same number of bonds accounted for. It's just that uh, those, that we have a resonance structure. Now, I actually, um, I have done something weird. I changed the symbol on that. Um, really, what is more correct is when we re represent resonance, we do it like this. See how the double bond is between that carbon and that carbon? If I just change it to that, that, and that, that's what resonance, that's how resonance is, is really defined or described. Um, you just give all the possible structures and then put the two arrows in between them. So it's not like flipping back and forth between those two things, it's an average of those two. All right, it's just about time to go. Just the last slide uh, asks us to do the same thing. What are the resonance structures of nitrite? Nitrite has one less electron on it than nitrate did. So yeah, here's the nitrite ion. Uh, but that double bond could just as likely be over there, so. <coughs> this is the way that you would draw the resonance of nitrite. Just give all the possible arrangements for where that double bond can go, and then connect them. The bond order on this one, there's three bonds divided up between two atoms, so the bond order is 1.5. So that's one and a half bonds, and that's one. This resonance. Have a nice Tuesday.